Hello and welcome to Timeless Truths, a sermon podcast from St. Mark Ministries in Greater Green Bay, Wisconsin. This week we continue our series, Thriving in a Time of Crisis. In episode 5, let's join Pastor John Parlow as we learn about faith in a metro-spiritual world. So open up your heart, open up your Bible, and let's dig into these timeless truths. Welcome back, or for the first time, welcome as we continue a series that we've entitled Thriving in a Time of Crisis so that we as Jesus followers know how we can best live for Christ and share his message in a world that is often caught up in darkness and drifting further from Jesus. And so I'm so happy to have you here as we take a look at another real key to Christianity that sometimes uh, isn't well received but needs to be shared. Throughout the life of the Christian church on earth, there's always been cultural strife, warfare, if you will. But when the end does come, there's only going to be two cultures, heaven and hell. And right now, you and I live in the in-between time between the launch of the Christian church on earth, Acts chapter 2, and the church triumphant when Jesus returns a second and final time for judgment. During that in-between time in which we now live, in a sense, what we do matters because, in a sense, what we do either pulls heaven down into our lives or hell up into our lives. And the more we see the Bible taken out of society, out of culture, out of academia, out of families, out of marriages, out of people's lives, out of even Christianity in some cases, the more we're pulling hell up into our lives. And that's exactly what is happening right now in this mission field we call America. And one of the ways they're trying to remove God's truth from our culture and world is through something called deconstructionism. Deconstructionism, just simply put, is when you don't believe in a certain belief, usually it's a belief or some creed, and so you tear it down, you destroy it, and then you redefine it so it matches what you want to believe and say. And that's exactly what's happened to us, really, aggressively in the last five years. We have deconstructed gender. We have deconstructed sex. We have deconstructed the family. We have deconstructed marriage. We have deconstructed truth. We have deconstructed, in some cases, Christianity. Everything seems to be in demolition mode. And when you live in such a tornado of of crisis and chaos, you need to center yourself, or better yet, be centered on the one who is in control of all things. I really believe that Jesus' followers like you can thrive in a time of crisis like the one we're currently in. But you got to keep your focus on Jesus and his word. His word needs to be really something you cherish and read on a regular basis because it's God's word. Remember, remember, the Bible is not a book that just tells you what happened, like a divine history book. It's a book that tells you what always happens. The Bible isn't an old book. It's an eternal book. It's always timely because it's over all the times. Last week, Pastor Ben did a great job starting this series and talking about a rather progressive lie that's peddled in all corners of our world, a delusional belief that says this, hey, you are by nature good, and this world's getting better. And the Bible says, no, you are by nature bad, and this world is getting worse. But it's that progressive lie today that you're good and we're getting better that's being peddled many times as the gospel message in many Christian churches. And that's tragic. There are many churches today who will gladly tell you what they're for. Hey, we're for love and peace and acceptance and Jesus, or their version of Jesus. But they won't tell you what, uh, what they're against or what Jesus was against. And they certainly don't want to use the S word, sin. They simply don't have the courage to tell someone no because they're afraid someone will accuse them of spiritual abuse. Well, what does your pastor do? Well, he told me to stop sinning. That, that offends me. And so they don't have the courage to say no. And in that process, they, they put the people that they're serving in Jesus' name 
at risk, spiritually speaking. And today what we see is one of the attacks you'll see of deconstructionism today in the Christian church is people trying to tell you in the church, stop saying that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Now this is where the discussion can get tense. We live in a culture that pushes hard against any kind of objective truth. Tolerance, justice, personal beliefs, really, or personal freedoms, are the buzzwords of what people have as their opinions as their truth. And that is clearly seen whenever you talk about religion. Isn't that true? Uh, Poll after poll in America right now says the vast majority of Americans believe in heaven. And that same majority think they're going to heaven. But when you dig a little deeper, you find out they're all not on the same path to heaven. I mean, when you have a discussion like this with your friends, family members, coworkers, classmates, or someone that is really closely related to you, at some point in these discussions, you're going to hear something like this. Well, you're a Christian, and, and you, you guys think that Jesus is the only way to heaven. I think that's unfair. I think you're a narrow-minded bigot. I think you're an unloving racist. Well, what are you going to say? Because you should say something. May I suggest you say what Jesus said? They can disagree with you. They can't disagree with Jesus, not if they're honest. Jesus said this. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Where do you start with someone who claims tolerance but is very intolerant? I would suggest you start by setting the record straight. Christianity is not the only religion that claims exclusivity. Sometimes people will say, well, you Christians believe you're the only ones going to heaven. Yes, that's true. But there are other world religions that claim that same exclusivity. Just do a little study on your own. Jewish people officially believe that uh, the God of the Torah, the first five books, or the God of the entire Old Testament, same God, but that's the only true God and that Jesus isn't God, and so stop calling him the Messiah or the Christ. Muslims believe that only Allah is God and that if you call Jesus the Son of God, you should be condemned or worse. Major Eastern religions today teach that they are the only ones that can bring you to their version of heaven. So this claim that Christianity is the only religion that spews such intolerance is specious. But I would suggest that when you have this kind of discussion, you really focus on the premise of the belief that the road to heaven is an eight-lane highway Instead of, instead of a narrow road like Jesus said. Because there's a foundation there underneath this belief that there are many roads to heaven that is injurious to your soul. It strikes at the very heart of the gospel. You see, the foundational belief that, hey, there are many roads to heaven has a great truth wrapped around it that's a falsehood masquerading as a truth. And you've heard this truth before, or this fake truth. Here it is. Good people go to heaven. Not just good Christians go to heaven, good Mormons go to heaven. Not just good Mormons go to heaven, good Jehovah's Witnesses go to heaven. Not good just good Jehovah's Witnesses go to heaven, good Muslims go to heaven. Not just good Muslims go to heaven, good Hindus go to heaven. Not just good Hindus go to heaven, good Buddhists go to heaven. Not just good Buddhists go to heaven, even good people who are irreligious, they go to heaven. They believe the common denominator isn't a belief system or religion, rather it's good people. And so such people believe that one day God's going to come back and he's going to go ahead and he's going to go throughout the globe and gather up all the good people from all systems and religions and places, religious and irreligious, and that good God's going to take him to a good place called good heaven. And that is what a lot of people believe today. In fact, you have a lot of Christians who actually believe in that sitting in this place like this. 
If you would ask some of those people, if you were to assume room temperature and die, why is God letting you into heaven? And they're going to say things like, well, I'm a pretty good person. I go to church once in a while. I try not to cuss a lot. I don't drink too much, or at least I don't think I do. I try to be a good husband and a parent. I try to love my neighbor as myself. Oh, I, I'm not perfect. And they always will tell you they're not perfect. They'll readily admit that. But then in that conversation, they'll go on and talk about how they're closer to perfection than imperfection by telling you about all the good things they've done and all of the nice tries they've attempted and all of the good thoughts they, they thought. Oh, they'll tell you that they're, they're not perfect but they'll work a lot to convince you that they're good because deep down they believe that's what counts. you got to be good because that's what they believe how you get into heaven. It's good people go to heaven. That's what they believe. Well, there are some major problems with that idea that uh, good people go to heaven. And my friends, the, the major problem in all of that is, or one of the major ones, and I think it's the top one, is this. We don't have the standard of good and bad if it's true that good people go to heaven. I mean, if it's true that good people go to heaven, shouldn't we have the standard that says what goodness is? If a good God is going to take good people to a good place like heaven, and the standard is you have to be good, then he has to be good and gracious enough to tell us what that standard of goodness is so that you can know and I can know that our good is good enough. That was hard to memorize, just so you know. (laughs) But the problem is, we don't have that information. Now at this point, American Christians will pick up their Bibles and say, but this is it. This is the standard of how good you got to be to get into heaven. You got to love your neighbor as yourself. Watch your mouth. Use your money wisely. Go to church once in a while. Right? Give some money to the poor. Try to live your life according to the good book. I hate to burst your bubble, but if you're using the Bible as your standard for goodness to get into heaven, you're not going. And the book you're pointing to tells you why. It says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Everybody trying to use the Bible as their standard to be good enough to get into heaven my friends, is, uh, is going to fail. Romans chapter 3 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. The Bible says, technically, there are no good people. We aren't, before a holy God. It goes on to say, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law, the good works. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. The Bible says that when you die, God's not going to look at you and go, Mark, what a good guy. You're obviously better than most of the people in your family that you hung around with, so why don't you come on in and I'll let you into my heaven. That's not going to happen. God didn't give us his law, the do's and the don'ts, so we could follow them and somehow earn heaven. Rather, God gave us his law, and one of the major reasons he did is so that you would know the truth about yourself, and I would know about myself. And that is we're not mistakers, we're not people who don't get it right once in a while. We're sinners who deserve hell, and so we need rescue. So don't use the Bible as your standard for goodness, because quite frankly, you're not that good. Another major problem with the, hey, all good people go to heaven program or religion, is we don't know how it grades out. I mean... What percentage of your life has to be good? 18%? 38%? 92%? I mean, you probably have an idea, but you don't know. And then what exactly counts? Now, you might say, well, when I was in school, never got an F. Or I've never been arrested. Or I have a perfect Sunday school attendance when I was a kid. How do you know those are the big ones? How do you know that? And when does it start to count in your life? When you're three years old? When you're 12 years old? I'm sure we don't want the high school and college years to count. Some of you are so old, you don't have much time left on this earth. You don't have enough time to balance the scales with some more good works, 
so to speak. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. For you to believe, or anybody to believe, for you to believe that good people go to heaven means you have no earthly idea of where you stand with God right now. For you to believe that good people go to heaven means you are hinging your eternity on something you made up, something that changes every week. For you to believe that good people go to heaven is the most unjust and unfair belief system, which, by the way, falls apart at the first analysis. Now, I know that Christianity sometimes can be difficult. It can. That's why you study. And people have questions, and that's great. But there are answers. Jesus was the only religious person who ever walked on this earth and taught this. Bad people go to heaven. Religious people do not. Now, he's referring to the religious people of his day, and we got those of ours as well. He's talking about the scribes and the Pharisees who live such good outward lives that they thought they were going to earn their way to heaven through their good works, as well as they wanted to be able to identify with the Messiah when he came. He'd be one of them. You know, he'd be one of them. And so Jesus, speaking about them on one occasion, said this, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Listen, they were the best people in the neighborhood. And Jesus says, they're not going because they're not, quote, good enough. And you've got to be better than them. So what is Jesus actually teaching? He's teaching this. Christianity teaches forgiven people go to, church, uh, go to heaven, not good people. And how do you get that forgiveness? Well, that's through Jesus. See, one of the aspects of Christianity that is so different than any other world religion or philosophy is Christianity is not about do, what you do, what you have to do. Rather, it's what's been done by Jesus through his perfect sacrifice on the cross. Christianity believes that forgiven people go to heaven, and the only way you have that forgiveness is through the free gift of faith given to you in Jesus Christ. I mean, just think about this. That's why Jesus had to be perfect and live a perfect life in our place. That's why the devil tries to tempt him once, because then he's not perfect and God demands perfection. See, good isn't good enough. Stop believing that. You don't believe that in your regular life. When you go to your mechanic to pick up your, your car, and you go, how'd it go? And he goes, I did a pretty good job. Are you driving that away? No, you're not driving that away. Or you go to pick up your prescription with your pharmacist, and she says, I did a pretty good job filling it. You taking that? If you don't settle for good is good enough, why should a holy God? So Jesus had to be perfect in our place. Then because God's a loving God, that means he has to be a just God. He can't let sin go unpunished. And so Jesus dies on the cross, sheds his blood for all sin because only God's blood covers all sin. So that your past doesn't need to be your future. And then, just to make sure everything's conquered and paid for, Jesus physically rises from the dead, assuring you as a Jesus follower, when you die, it only gets better for you. And meanwhile on this earth, no matter how tough it gets, something you need to remember. No matter how tough it gets as a Christian on this earth, this life is the closest you're going to get to hell. And for the unbelievers listening, this life is the closest you're going to get to heaven. So you're smart people, think about this. Can you think of a more unbiased and more merciful religion than Christianity. Christianity is the most fair and most just religion in an unfair and unjust world. First of all, everyone is welcome. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone gets in the same way. Enter through the narrow gate, Jesus said. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the row that leads to life, and only a few find it. On another occasion, Jesus said this, leaving all questions answered. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Everybody can meet the requirements in Jesus. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That's inclusive. God died for the world. That whoever believes in him, exclusive, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Everyone is welcome. Everyone gets in the same way. Everyone can meet the requirements. Now when you think about it, narrow doesn't sound so bad. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Timeless Truths. Whether you're a first-time listener or a long-time listener, we're glad you could join us. For more information or to support the work of St. Mark Ministries, check out our website at stmarkministries.com. Be sure to tune in next week as we continue our series, Thriving in a Time of Crisis. And remember, you matter and you are loved.